Thank you for that wonderful session. We really appreciate you, Doug. Uh, I also want to just let you guys know that um, without our sponsors, this could not be possible. So we do have our great sponsors right there. Castle Bioscience, as always, has been a great sponsor. We have Immunicore, um, and uh, they're going to be here on Saturday as well, as um, Delcap and the Angelus Clinic. So just a little commercial for them. So now we are going to have Dr. Arnett. Dr. Arnett is from Parkview Wellness. He is has an ex a very impressive resume. He has a bio in the back of your program. You can read all about him. He's going to talk to you about nutrition, but not just the food that you eat. So please welcome Dr. Arnett. Thank you, Melody. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Alan Arnett. Um, I have been in this field of healthcare, natural healthcare, for over 30 years. In a minute, I'll tell you a little bit about my bio, but what I'd like to do is to start with the end in mind. So I, too, also have a follow-up for this that I'd like to send you all to. So in case I run out of time, let's go ahead and go ahead and put in. This one is a little bit slower. You actually have to go to my website. And my business is named after a concept. Parkview Wellness. And on the home page, you'll see a button that says Ocular Melanoma Event. And I have created a 15-minute video, a chair-based relaxation and spinal movement. I'm a yoga instructor as well. Specifically to help bring down the sympathetic tone, to bring tension out of the eyes, and to bring tension out of the neck. So that is my gift to everybody. So all you have to do is go to my website, parkviewwellness.com, and on the page, it's right there. You don't have to do anything else. Just click that one button and follow it through. So please take the time and share that with anybody that you'd like. It's, uh, it's done in a chair, so you could uh, do it if you had had any type of procedures or if you're going through any type of uh, medical processes that have your energy too low uh, but still need to get energy into your body. So along with our session today, welcome. Thank you. Okay, a little bit about me. I have a beard and long hair now. That's funny. I'm Dr. Alan Arnett. I'm from Dallas, Texas originally. And in Texas in the 60s and 70s, my parents were what you in California is called hippies. And what it means is that they had a belief system. They didn't drive the VW vans and the tie-dye t-shirts, but they did drive Volvos and wear jeans to work. And I'll tell you, at that time, that was a renegade. Because we actually got spit on in our car because we drove a foreign car in the 70s in Texas. So people get their opinions very strong, and so I'm very strongly opinionated about what I believe. And that's what I'd like to do today is to share with you about my views. So as I came up as a hippie, I wanted to be a dancer, singer, and move people's energy. But I found that I had more talents in being able to help heal people. And what, how do I say that? Because I just would put my hands on people. I wanted to go do that, and I put my hands on people, like, oh, that's a miracle. I'm like, yeah, but I'm busy singing. <laughs> They're like, no, not, come here. So for 30 years, I finally listened. And that's the theme of today's talk, is listening. If you want to eat better, if you want to have better health, if you want your eyes to be better, you need to learn to listen. Learn to listen inside. So my logo is half and half, right? Half below the surface. 50% of all health is what you don't see. It's what's going on inside. I had a man that I was co-treating for liver cancer who had tears coming out of his eyes saying, I wish people could see that I was sick. Because even my own wife says, oh, you're feeling okay, you look fine. And he was dying of cancer. So when it's not on the surface, so many people just turn a blind eye. So I'm very powerfully involved in root cause medicine. So let's get right to it. What is spirit? Because I'm going to give you a definition as we're entering into this topic. Uh, the, de the definition of spirit can be very different based on what you're trying to get to. It's an elusive part of us, so it's hard to put words to. But here's mine. It's that aspect of our mind intelligence that reaches up to explain stuff that we can't explain. Like birth death, where did we come from, where did we go, what is my purpose in life, those deep questions that burn inside the heart, no matter how much money you have, no matter how sick you are, these questions still linger around and they waft around. And so that element, that ability of our being to reach for something that abstract, not intellectually, but as a sensate experience is what I'm defining for today as spirit. In the Old Testament, they referred to spirit as wind or as breath, less so to God. From the ancient medicines, from India and from China, breath and wind and spirit are synonymous. So, uh, spirituality is about exploring, exploring the inside of yourself. 
You could say religion is about how we govern each other, but we're not talking about that today. So this spirituality that I'm bringing in today is really more what happens inside of yourself. You could say your relationship with God, that's fine. And it might not be God, it might be universal consciousness. It might be something simply more abstract as just energy out into the universe. But there is, and we'll get into this in a moment, a higher part to all people, even if they've not developed it. All right, because I'm an acupuncturist primarily by day trade, uh, chi, or there's two different ways to spell chi, Mandarin or Cantonese, chi from uh, Japan or prana from India, they're all referring to this life force. And so, uh, let's see, what words did I pick? Also referred to as wind, breath, the breath of life, force of life. These become synonyms. We can interchange them, especially for today's talk. A living intelligence that permeates and penetrates form. So in that definition, even this chair has a consciousness of some sorts. Certainly we know scientifically it's spinning with electrons, and so we know that it does have energy, even though it seems inert to us. And the pulse of life seeking to express itself, that has its own fundamental desire to express itself. You do not have to ask, you don't have to go up to like a teenager on a couch and go, would you please come to life? It's just seeking to express itself at all times. So, nature loves intelligence. Some people call intelligence nature or nature intelligence. And the ancients called that spirituality. So let's define nutrition, okay? We're going to talk about spirit and nutrition, so let's give a definition of nutrition. To me, nutrition is a modern language of defining how we relate to food. So nutrition is, to me, nothing but a new language. Uh, and so I have a few words here. They might sound pejorative, they don't mean to be, but maybe because I'm the acupuncturist I have a bias. I'll acknowledge that up front. It's the molecular description of food. Nobody talks about eating the macro things anymore. Did you have proteins or carbs today? No, 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 I had too many fats today. Oh, you're doing a keto diet? Are you doing a paleo diet? Are you doing a low-carb diet? Are you doing a high-carb diet? No, I'm doing a no inter intermittent fasting diet. And the entire language is about the molecular description of food. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad, just letting you know that's a language of a way of relating to it. It treats all molecules as if they are the same. A protein is a protein. So the molecule lysine, Maybe you've heard of the molecule lysine, some people use it to treat various things. Would therefore be the same whether it came from chicken or whether it came from a plant or whether it came from petroleum products. We don't like to hear that, but that's what science says. Relates to food through the brain-body idea. It's all intellect. It's not a sensate. We don't sense the molecules. I sense I need. We're using our brain. Source of materials is less important. Again, as long as you get to that lysine molecule, where it came from, theoretically, according to science, shouldn't or doesn't matter. And calories are calories. There, there's no difference in calories. So if you have a thousand calories of cabbage sitting here, sliced cabbage organic, and you have a thousand calories of pudding over here, according to science, they're the exact same calories. A calories a calories a calorie. And I will tell you as a clinician, and that's my perspective today, as the clinician, they're not the same. They don't function the same. They don't do the same thing. But there's still a thousand calories. And so a calorie, as we'll talk about, may not be a calorie. And belief that all nutrition is simply molecular. So how do you choose? Well, if we're going through the molecular route, then we're going to look at scientific research, yes? But it's coming out more and more stuff that only a few people knew. And that is a great deal of the stuff we call research really itself has a lot of flaws in it. It doesn't mean these are propagated by bad people. I'm not implying that, though some are. Come to my house on Friday with a beer, I'll tell you other stories. <laughs> but in public, I'm going to say nice things, because really a lot of people are trying to progress this information forward. And, but the problem is, is that it's complicated. The problem is, is that things are not as easy to measure. And some things are harder to measure, like your response to foods and foodstuffs. Plus, then at the end of doing research on foodstuffs, who's making the money? If it's only for the patient and the physician, no one cares about them. It's only the industries that really matter. So there isn't a lot of research done on food unless it's going to produce a supplement or a drug. And this is just the practical reality of the world. We can get upset about it, but it is the way it is. So I've got proposals for this. That's why I'm saying it this way. Here are the citations for at least two of them, so I'm not just making this up. Okay, so let's start with what most people are familiar with. Macromolecules, you may not know it as that, but most people know amino acids, fatty acids, and carbohydrates. So let's say a couple of scientific things that we've all seen on social media or read in little textbooks or took in our little webinars we got on the net. 
They build neurotransmitters, they build neurohormones, they build neuropeptides. They build basically a lot of the building blocks that your nervous system and your brain utilize. Amino acids also make enzymes for cellular function. Well, your body cannot function if the cells are not working, so it seems like amino acids are quite important. Fatty acids have their own version of a similar story. They provide nourishment directly to the brain and nerves. That's why when we eat a low-fat diet, we go cray-cray. Uh, and that's uh, medical for crazy. And it protects against free radical damage. This is the most important part. And this is the number one reason why diabetes is just through the roof, because people are not eating enough fatty acids, or they're getting the wrong ratio. Carbohydrates. They provide valuable fibers. So even in this low-carb uh, craze, which if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, but we don't get rid of the carbs. Valuable fiber and fiber feeds our micronutrients. With all this dysbiosis going on, disgruntled intestines, not eating the right carbs is a big cause of that. Provides necessary energy, and it can actually hold water. Carbs hold water, they make you swell. So if you're dehydrated, you want to eat oats to hold water. And if you're swelling and it's that time of the month, you want to not eat carbs because they're going to make you bloat. So if all of the molecules are the same, then, then is there a source of the molecules? It doesn't matter, right? It's immaterial. And wherever that protein came from, I mean, I literally could go take this carpet and grind it up, and if there was protein, then I could eat it. Is that correct? That's what science has got us to at this point. We do not differentiate between the product at Rite Aid and the product at the health food store. We do not differentiate between the product at some unscrupulous place like a low-end grocery store that gets their products from from very unscrupulous sources, and there's no governing on the FDA for supplements. And the same supplement with the same name, amino acid, is sold at a high-level place where they've spent lots of money to get you a good quality version, and there's zero discrepancy because, right, a protein is a protein, doesn't matter. So, how do we make these determinations? I say to you, proteins are not proteins. And as I show you a picture, every one of you would start, oh yeah, okay, well, I get that, I don't think those are the same. But these both are going to have proteins, they're both going to have fatty acids, and they're both going to have carbs. So from a science standpoint, it doesn't matter. And this is the negation to the health food option, is that food is food is food. It doesn't really matter. Your body will utilize what it needs and get rid of the rest. That's the statement by the naysayers. And while everyone gets their opinion, I'm here to tell you that's not my opinion. After 30 years in the clinic, I will tell you this makes the biggest difference in success and failure in most medical conditions. When we all see things as material, then that kicks in survival, because then all there is is survival of the fittest on the material level. Survival creates fear. When we are in a survival mode, and if anyone here has been diagnosed with cancer, you've felt that. If anyone in here has loved someone who was diagnosed with cancer, you've felt that. My father last year was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Just hearing the words, you feel that, your entire body, boom. And it shuts down thought, and it shuts down rational thought, and it turns on heavy emotions. And it's a thing to go through, isn't it? But this is a very real thing. Now, the reason I put this up here is to not tell you something you already know. Back over to my story where I was from Texas with my hippie parents. <laughs> my dad was a marketer. And he used to say funny things to me when I was watching TV. And back then you had to get up to turn the volume. So he would get up off the TV and turn off the TV show. What are you doing, Dad? He'd say, what did that commercial just sell you? Dad, it was toilet paper. No, they did not sell you toilet paper. They sold you that your toilet paper is terrible and they have the only solution. Marketing has one function, no matter what it's selling. It's to make what you have not work, be inferior and be bad, so that they have the solution only. That's marketing. They create fear to get you to buy products. It doesn't matter if it's toilet paper or brochures or health care, because that also is a commerce in our country. We think that health care is something we should purchase, not an inalienable right. So here we go. Why are there no commercials for veggies? Because you have to sell us this stuff. There is no animal on the planet that would walk up and see this green monster here selling some type of yellow cake with green goo and call it delicious. We've done research, even cockroaches won't eat Twinkies. They put them in the cage for like six months, the cockroaches won't even touch the Twinkie. And yet we eat these Twinkies. Because a protein is a protein and a carb is a carb, and none of that matters where the source comes from, right? This is what's been drummed into us. Now here's one that's some surprising to some. 
one of the most unscrupulous uh, nutritional products on the market. When you turn it over, the protein's at the bottom and everything else is filler binders, extracts, and excipients, and flavor enhancers, and texture enhancers, and binders, and colors to get it down your mouth. Because people go, oh, that shouldn't taste bad, it should taste good, like I'm in a circus or a fair. And so they make it cherry flavored and they get all this unscrupulousness because we think that a protein is a protein and a carb is a carb. Now here, this is just funny, you can tell I like to laugh. Fried bacon in a can. Now you can't see it, but it says right here, needs no refrigeration. <laughs> or, you know, yeah, and it's sugar cured fried bacon in a can. I'm from Texas, I just know my relatives are eating that. <laughs> but the thing is, you have to be sold on this. That's why there's millions of dollars, because it's not natural to want to eat this on a regular basis. Likewise, fear comes up when we feel out of control, when we get labs, when we get images, when we get procedures, oftentimes they're treating the disease, not us, and we're over there scared to death. And that loses then our ability, how do we know, where's my protein? My dad was in the hospital getting infinite numbers of transfusions, to which they said the one thing you can't bring in the hospital is a vegetable, it'll kill you. This is in Texas. The theory is it has bad bacteria, it will kill you. But what they serve you, now I'm not kidding, I have to tell you this, this is funny. So my mother says, son, you're going to laugh at this. I, she took a picture of the menu in the hospital at the hotel. High-end hotel, they got good insurance. A hospital. And what it showed was the foods that my dad got to choose from. My father's orders for his condition was that cancer has no basis in food, so you can eat whatever you want. And it started off with eggs and bacon and sausage and, and ground beef and turkey. And then, of course, barbecue sandwich, barbecue pork sandwich, barbecue beef sandwich, and Pepsi and Coke and Mr. Tibb and Mountain Dew. And then you had the delicious and healthful uh, uh, desserts made up of tapioca pudding. <laughs> But you cannot, and they would say, do not bring vegetables into the hospital. So, here's what happened. It's a really interesting story. So my father, who thinks he listens to me, gets the diagnosis of cancer, becomes terrified. All thought goes out of his mind. I call him up instantly with my bravery. I've helped many people. Dad, just follow this. It included a lot of dietary changes from what he was eating. He is a Texan. And so, he started to change mostly out of fear. Well, it turned out that behind the scenes, my mom was like, I don't want to change my food. Why am I having to eat different food? I'm stressed now because you're sick. I want to eat my familiar food. But she kind of knew not to tell me. So what happened was it resulted in at one of the oncological visits, my father asked the oncologist. My son is a nutritionist, wants me to eat better. And the oncologist said, sir, your cancer was not caused by your diet. You can eat anything you want. What is it that you're wanting to eat? I'd love a steak and some alcohol. Go home and have as much as you like, sir. Your cancer has nothing to do with any food that you consume. So, with that bravery, he marches home, and they eat the steak and apple. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. I'm not kidding you. Son, my stomach's really upset. What have you been eating? Steak and alcohol. <laughs> well, that's not going to make you feel good. I recommend a salad. I'm being funny here. So, he goes, oh, okay. You mean that food I started eating a while ago? Yeah. Why don't you try that? Calls me two weeks later, hey, I'm feeling much better. That nutrition's good for my digestion. Whatever it takes. And what I found is that there was a psychological process that people have to go through if they don't already know how to eat good food. Because they're faced with stress, and stress got Twinkies. And now you're telling me not to eat the Twinkie. Now I'm just stressed. This isn't a good way to make food choices. It's likely that those two weeks of alcohol and beef actually made his his being relax a bit to where he could be honest and go, you know, I just don't feel good. Because he could have easily just tried to prove me wrong, right? You know men are stubborn. Maybe none of those room. <laughs> but where I come from, men can be stubborn. So what happened was now he eats for his nutrition. Now he eats because it makes him feel better. Now he goes to the hospital for his infusions and he doesn't want the barbecue sandwich and he can't bring in vegetables. So guess what my Texas mother does? She brings in bootleg car carrot juice. <laughs> she makes carrot juice, puts it in the thermos, puts it under her coat, and comes into the hospital. <laughs> and she pours some, and he drinks it, and he says, oh my God, it tastes, it feels so good. And laying in a bed for two days, in, uh, getting infusion and eating barbecue sandwich, what do you think his eliminations are like? <gasps> carrot juice made him go within two hours, laying down. So even as a medicine, it was the most appropriate. Well, but they can't tell him that he's doing that. So, you know, we have some interesting cray-cray. 
This is not done on purpose to make you afraid. The net result is that it makes us afraid. And when we are fearful, we do not make wise decisions. So what, who, what do you trust? What do you trust regarding what to eat? Just because your neighbor worked on a keto diet, well, it might not work for me. Just because your neighbor ate muffins and her thinness, that doesn't mean that. This person over here ate nothing and cured their cancer. What do you trust? Well, I do propose, please. I do propose that there is a way to make choices from within. And this is not random choice. It's how I'm in the mood for macaroni and cheese. You know, we have moods, of course, but I don't recommend moods as a basis. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more. In fact, you could say this is the, 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 the bulk of the talk. That's... So things just simply aren't equal. Proteins are not proteins, and carbohydrates are not carbohydrates. The scientist who stares at the microscope is cringing at that statement, but I have a basis for which I say that to you. <coughs> There are different layers of our existence, and we experience a multi-dimensional reality at every single moment. We are not one linear experience where all proteins are the same. I just showed you so many things that your gut went, yeah, that fast food's not the same as that vegetable. Just because the scientist in the microscope says lysine is lysine the world over, turns out clinically it's just not true. So, layers of life. There are many different descriptions. And this is a simple one, only to prove our point in our short little talk today. So I think of this as going from the least dense to the most dense. And the thing we can relate to is when you see pictures of the ocean, right? The surface of the ocean is where we are. And at every 33 feet as you go down in the ocean, it gets denser, more pressure. Almost everyone can relate to that, right? So extrapolate that, that that's how we are made up of. And our physical body is the most pressurized. It's the physical form. We have a mental, I like the word mental loop. This is the part where we use our mind. And even um, uh, Darwin said that while he understands how all of this movement is moving forward through evolution, the thing he didn't really understand was the mind. The mind is what didn't make sense to him. So we kind of put that little caveat in there. Uh, I'm very sorry. That was not Darwin. The guy who dropped the apples. Newton. That was Newton, because he said, I've discovered the laws of physics. Thank you for correcting brain's work uh, behind. And so Newton, who dropped the apple, discovered physics, said, physics is the world over. But in his notation, I don't know what the mind is. Because you drop an apple in the mind, it can float around, it can turn into something else, it can turn into a flower. I don't understand the mind. And then we have this thing all the way up here that's the hardest to prove, and that is this spiritual or elusive self. Yet, no one can explain where information actually comes from. We've not been able to find where memory is stored in our body. Memory is certainly not in anybody's muscle. If you cut a nerve, the muscle goes flaccid instantly. The memory is all contained within the nerves, but we can't find the location for memory because it's, I believe, held in these higher data fields. And our brain and our body become the equivalent of, a, of an antenna that begin to perceive or to extract this non-physical, non-local mind, and it brings it into points of action. So, layers of decision-making. Sorry that I'm walking back and forth. It's morning, I've had coffee. <laughs> Physical survival is this bottom level. Now, here, we make choices based on immediate need. If you've ever been in a car ride, it doesn't matter what you want to eat. You're hungry, and there is a Stuckey's. You know, so you're going to eat crap. It's just there, you're hungry. Food is food is food is food. On the survival level, it doesn't matter. My dog will eat anything, and a human will practically eat anything. I mean, I've been to China. We ate scorpions. We ate slugs. They tried to get us to eat monkey brains. I didn't want to get viruses. But, you know, they'll eat anything. Reactive eating. Well, your reactions are what on the physical plane. If I came up and poked you, oh, that's a reaction. So when we do reactive eating, we're not thinking about anything except whatever is inside the habit pattern at that moment. This is a great deal of what uh, the gentleman Doug before me was talking about, about these habits that come up. And are you able to recognize that you have these habitual patterns? So what I recognize is that as you go and you work with this great stuff that Doug is representing and the stuff that Tony Robbins' shoulders he's standing on, I did Tony in 1990, what I'm telling you is that is all standing upon the shoulders of this wisdom. So it's all a synonymous thought process, just different ways to kind of extract it. And so in this way, we understand that emotional eating is just reactive eating, believing your emotion and acting from that perspective. This is all physical or survival. That means that person in that moment feels fearful about something. 
The mental or energetic way to, to kind of choose food is to use academic knowledge. Now, this is what I do for a living. I will tell you to eat this, and I will tell you to eat that. And I'm giving you pieces of paper and websites, and you're using your intellect to read it, and then to try to make changes. That's a good way, and it relies on, on research and other people's opinions and so forth. The spiritual and intuitive realm for food selection is feeling the effect of the food on your mind-body. So it starts in first and foremost by not even asking you what the food tasted like. It asks you how it felt and what was the result for you. Not your husband or wife, not your kids, not your neighbor, not your doctor. How did you feel? That's why sometimes we eat an apple, we feel good, we eat an apple, we feel bad. Because we're not listening to what the body is needing. Makes choices based on the state of the food we want to be in. I wanted to have good, clear mind this morning, so I did not stop, not that I would, but I'm making a point, I didn't stop by and have a meaty, bready, cheesy sandwich. I'm from Texas, I have those in my taste buds, I like the taste. That would have made me heavy and sluggish, so I woke up and had celery juice. How Californian. <laughs> Allows a natural variation in diet. So as soon as I came in here, and I'm all good, I saw some pastries. I don't think I'm gluten sensitive, and they look really good, and you know I'm about to burn a lot of calories standing up on stage, so I had a little bite. Because in that moment, that little bit of bite in the day of a whole day of good food, unless I'm having an allergy problem, is actually okay. This variation in diet is why this can't ever fully work. Well, you'll only eat this. No, that's not going to work. Understanding from an intuitive level. Now, this is where we dive off the deep end, because then some people are going to say, what, I'm supposed to just eat what I want? You know, it's a slippery slope. This is why I have to counsel people on food. I think food is a psych issue. It is not a nutrition issue. It is a psych spiritual issue. It is not a nutrition issue. If all we had to do is tell people what to eat, then we all would already be just completely perfect, right? And every one of us resists what we hear because just because you tell me to do something doesn't mean my, I'm in a non-reactive state and it doesn't mean I'm feeling what I eat. Next slide, please. This is another way to look at layers of life. This is upside down in relation to the previous one. This comes from my time when I studied and developed my meditation teaching with Deepak Chopra at his place in the San Diego. This is the spirit section. This is the mental and this is the physical. The value of this pr quick picture is that we pinch things off at the level of ego. It's the ego that wants the macaroni and cheese. It's the ego that wasn't, doesn't want that gosh darn celery. I'm from Texas. People will actually argue, though, I get in your face, they'll get on a gun and tell you they don't want to eat celery. Don't tell me I have to eat celery. Because here's the biggest resistance to all food, right? I'm going to die anyway. To which I say, well, you're slowly dying, but you're killing me now. <laughs> and my mother would say, well, if you're trying to hear yourself, that's an awfully slow way to do it. There's faster ways to do that. Killing yourself through food is the slowest way, the most painful way to go through life. And this is how people live their life, trying to figure out their intellect, should I do this, should I not do this, while well, always in a reactive state, always mostly in a reactive state. Thank you. So, here are some choices of the different levels. So I brought some solutions today so that we weren't just talking about ideas. On the physical level, we need to choose foods when survival is in question. If it's between me and not eating because I'm starving, then I'm going to eat kind of whatever is there and is edible, and we don't need to make such a big deal about it. I actually had to say that to my dad when he was in the hospital because my mother couldn't get him enough carrot juice. Dad, just eat the barbecue sandwich. Let's get you out of the hospital. Right? So that was a moment. It's like, okay, well, that's not proper nutrition. No, that's treating a patient, which is far more important. The challenge is, are we really in survival? Oh, my God, Betty Jane just broke up with me today. I have got to eat a cheeseburger. Is it really that big a deal? Or are you just feeling emotion? In which case, let's address the emotion. Let's walk on some glass. Let's do some meditation. Let's go to Dr. Annette's little video. We have choices, and I will tell you that if you spend even a few minutes calming yourself down before you eat, you will eat less, and you will eat more of the foods that simply feel good. Not what tastes good, and not what you think is good. Because it's your state that you approach right when you're about to sit down to eat. That's why I'm giving you this video, because if you'll do that 15-minute chair video right before you eat, I promise you, your stomach and your intestines will begin to change. 
Or are you just wounded? Are you wound up? Are you in your head? Are you driven by outer forces? In other words, are you simply somewhere else? When you're making food choices from here, you're in survival. This absolutely raises cortisol, raises inflammation. And if you're battling cancer, I don't care what your oncologist says, I think this influences cancer. I'll be on the record for saying that. I'm one of those who are going to vote for that. All right, the mental energetic level for making choices. Use this level most of the time. Most of the time we're going to reason ourselves. I woke up today. I thought, well, I'm going to do this, so therefore I'm going to eat that, right? That was my mental that decided. I didn't intuit in that moment how I felt, because I knew if I ate the meat sandwich with cheese and bread how I would feel, and I knew already how I was going to feel with the celery juice, so I ate the celery juice because I wanted to feel a certain way. Does that make sense? I went to a friend's house over the holiday, and Saturday night at the end of the night, I had some fun dessert. It was way too late, but I'm doing nothing but sleeping the next day. The next day I woke up and had celery juice. Okay. The spiritual intuitive is really the thing I think is going to be the most interesting to you. It's certainly the most novel and taught. Is to learn to listen to your body, mind, spirit when you eat what you eat. Most people only listen to the taste buds. As long as the taste buds were good and you feel nice and overly full, we call it good. I have many friends who own restaurants. The happiest customer is the one who proclaims they are the fullest. Ate the largest amount of food possible. To them, in America, that's a good meal. So places like Claim Jumper, which serves you two pieces of chicken fried steak. Now, I'm from Texas. They don't even go that far. And so the thing is, is that when we eat with our eyes, when we eat with our mind, when we eat with our reactions, and all we're going to do is to continue to reinforce habits, because the habit is what happens when you're scared. When you're scared, you need to rely upon what you've already got in you. You can't really think your way out of a problem when you're scared. And so if you perceive you're scared or stressed or worried or anxious or thought or victimed, then you're going to be making food choices largely from the survival or the intellectual realm. And that creates battles, and then the green Twinkie wins. <laughs> That's how it goes. So I don't ask you to use your mind and overpress that. I don't tell you, if you want to eat a Twinkie, go eat the Twinkie and come tell me how it made you feel. That's all I would ask. Because if you ate it once, you'd probably go, I felt good, I enjoyed it. It made me think of my childhood, and I really enjoyed it. But you know when I ate it the second time, I didn't feel as good. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Listen. And we can't listen when we're busy talking. This is the problem with the media. Now, I'm, I, I check into social media. I like to watch all of these things, but not while eating. So I'm going to close this little section. We're going to open it for Q&A in just a moment. But I'm going to close this section by saying a physiological truth. Our biological body is wired to survive. We have survived millions of years as cells. We are a collection of cells and hundreds of thousands of years as a human being in some form or another. And as we have evolved, we have developed our intellect. We've cultivated our intellect. And as that has evolved, we have cultivated our ability to expand beyond even that and begin to pierce into this spiritual realm. And I propose that's where all knowledge comes from. It's stored in the cloud. And that's why when your brain is busy digesting yesterday's food, you can't remember things. It's not that you're old, it's that you're still digesting yesterday's Twinkie. And there's no energy left over to think. And so you know what happens when you're tired? You know the first organ that gets physically squeezed when you get stressed and hungry? Your eyes. Eye pressure is a result of cray-cray thinking. It is highly wired to your thought process because your eyes are the number one sense organ for survival. you got to see. you got to see. And in, in, tension in the eye, tension in the back of the neck. How many people here brush their teeth at least once a week? <laughs> see, you laugh because most of you are once a day or twice a day or three times a day, right? right? We've been indoctrinated that if that stuff, the plaque builds up, what happens to the teeth? They die. Around the world, the dentists get the prize. The dentists get the prize for teaching people the truest essence of health and wellness, and it did not diminish the dental industry. The dental industry is just fine. And they'll be the first one to tell you, now you go take care of your teeth. That's the kind of doctor I want to go to. I do not believe that if we start eating better, that suddenly we're not going to need medicine. But I do believe that there are forces out there who don't want you to know that you have options and possibilities and that you can cultivate these elements. It's to their advantage that you stay afraid. 
Forces, general word. Come to my house Friday night, I'll get specific. <laughs> so what I want to say, let's go to the next one, please. This word placebo in science is pejoratively used. Oh, honey, they just believe that. Like, somehow that's inferior. See, the reality is, is that at the moment the patient treats is with the clinician, that's where healthcare is administered. It's not administered in research. It's not administered in these moments of webinars and seminars. It's administered at the moment when the clinician and the patient are interacting with each other. And at that moment, if a clinician can get 30 to 40% improvement by the patient believing what they're doing, why would we not capitalize on that? I'm going to call placebo our opening up to receiving the instructions that heal the body. Do you think humans would have lasted so long if we were this precarious? We've gotten this far, and now suddenly we're so weak. <coughs> I have to have all these pills to prop me up. I have to have all this stuff to prop me up. Where's my fear? Where's my fear? Well, it's right here. I live in fear. And I watch TV, and I do social media, and I believe everything. Well, what do you believe inside? Inside? Oh, no, they're told me not to believe that. That's just crazy, right? Your placebo is what you came in with. This is like a Macintosh chip. You came in with color sound from the beginning. You may not know it. You may not develop it. You may not cultivate it. But this is what health is right here. If you believe yourself to get well, and I don't mean just randomly say it, you have to have an energetic, neurological, neurochemical change that I believe is only experienced through physical sensations like meditation, yoga, acupuncture, tai chi, qigong. These are at least the starting points. We'll develop new ones. But right now we're in love with yoga and we think it's a way to get a cute yoga butt. You know, physical, physical, physical. And I don't mind that. But there needs to be more. Additional. So let's not say that the earth element is bad. Let's not say survival is bad. Let's say that the placebo is your spiritual intuitive self that's just begging to be developed. When you hear about spontaneous remissions from anything but particularly cancer, Bingo. something opened up and they surrendered to something higher. And in that consistent action and belief and change in neurochemistry, nature does her job. So this image is the last image before I open up for Q&A. It's, it's, it's artistically poetic. To the Texas male, this is something that a bunch of girls would look at. That's not real medicine. Sir, they've already turned off my lecture, I can tell you. But for those of you that have the ability to think beyond the survival mode, you will begin to see that this is a metaphor. Our roots at the bottom. Do you know the word stool is Indian for earth? It's that part of us that returns to the earth. It's not to be sequestered. It's to go back into the earth. And that's where we draw our nutrients from. Yeah. The analogy here is your colon is where you draw your nutrients. And it's not till you move through all of these levels that this lotus blossom opens up. That's an Indian metaphor, of course, because they have lotus blossoms. Ours might be a rose. Don't get caught up in the specifics. What it means is that this cannot flower unless the roots are nice and healthy. It's a simple thing. It goes back to my logo. And so, my logo says that your roots are half the issue. What you cannot see is half the issue. If you want pretty leaves, you can't go paint the leaf. You've got to go nourish the roots and tend to the roots and tend to the soil. That's what health care is. It's not glamorous. If I can make a fun pun, it's a little shitty. <laughs> just to be funny, just to be funny. All right, so here's my website, and this is where the, the link is for your free 15-minute chair-based relaxation breath and spinal motion. It's designed for people even with some degree of disabilities or surgeries. It's not, you don't even lift your arms above your head. You don't need to go buy yoga clothes or a block. I teach those classes if you like them. But that's not what people need when they're going through cancer situations. They need something that's more put together for healing and less about the physical only. So, I'd like to open up the floor to questions that I may have stimulated. My goal with the day, today's presentation is to hopefully have put some information in your mind that makes you think. Maybe you heard something in a different way, maybe you heard something in a new way, and maybe that makes your brain go, well, what is that? And it makes you curious, and to talk. I don't need to be right, I want people to get well. Yes, I have a question. Ask away. What you said, and I started writing it down, but I didn't remember what you 
Oh. <laughs> eye pressure is highly sensitive to. Oh yes, no. High, eye pressure is highly sensitive to your internal stresses and your thought patterns. See, your thought patterns are your electricity in your brain, right? I mean, we've come that far. Most people in this room would know that your brain is electrical current. That's why it's mostly fat, because fat buffers electricity. And if you don't have fat, then the electricity would explode your head. So when you think, it starts off as electrical patterning. Well, if that electrical pattern, whatever thought, subconscious, unconscious thought, is there for more than 68 seconds, it starts to create the chemistry that matches that. We're wired that way. And so, when we have thoughts, let's say that I'm this lovely person and you think I'm just the greatest thing, but inside my head I'm still really upset that my father did not like me as a child. I'm making something. My father liked me. I'm just making something. <laughs> so every time I get even calm, what I hear in the background is, you're not any good, you'll never be good, oh, I hate you, I hate that. But it's so in the background that even the person themselves may be easily able to cover it up with chicken fried steak and alcohol. And maybe keeping themselves so busy they simply don't feel that. Most common outside of being scared of needles with acupuncture, people don't want to lay still because then they get to feel what's happening inside. They don't like it. That is the stress that helps to co-create cancer, not the stress on the outside. It is your nervous system that co-creates the molecular changes. So it's not whether you think you're happy or lovely or sweet or delicious or whether you're even a jerk. It's what your nervous system holds. And the, a significant area, even though this is about eye cancer here, I would say this to anybody, a significant area where we hold a great deal of thought tension is in the ocular system. The eyes, the optic nerve, all the way back to the suboccipital region. That's why I'm coming back in two days to talk about acupuncture for eyes, and we're doing an entire two-hour massage presentation from 11 to 1 on Saturday where two of my best guys are coming to give 10-minute eye massages from the back, the neck and so forth. These will be complimentary, but give them a tip. <laughs> and I also am having one of my best yoga instructors come and teach on Saturday. He's going to be working on grounding, going to be working on helping the breath to come into the body. It will not be a difficult class. There will be options for those of you that have yoga in your body if you want to go into something a little more vigorous, but that's not the intention of the class. The intention in a group setting is to let people experience their inner self as light, as fresh, as healing. Circulation is what heals. I could just simply come up and tweak a little uh, a blood vessel in your body, and if it reduced that blood supply to the other side enough, you could die. Circulation is it. And when we get tension, oh, I'm just tense, I'll take, a, I'll take a pain pill. Well, if you take a pain pill, you're just creating a wall between yourself and your body. So you've just said to your body, I'm ignoring you. So sometimes that needs to happen if you're going through procedures and there's surgeries. But most of the time, it's just people being cray-cray. That's all it is. I don't want to. I don't want to get the massage. I don't want to stretch. But you have pain here. You need to open that muscle. Well, I don't want to. I'm going to take a pill. Do you really think that that would help? Do you think that stretching would help? I don't know. Dr. Oz says there's a new pill. <laughs> and we spin and we spin and we spin because we're used to making decisions from only the intellect and out of fear. So I propose to... Yes, ma'am. Um, can you explain relationships between inflammation, nutrition, and cancer? Inflammation, nutrition, and cancer. Uh, the link is, is that the majority of inflammation is caused by our diet or our dietary indiscretions and specifically how it interacts with ours individually. So on the surface, it means crap food can help cause cancer in a variety of reasons. Even the research on that is good. Everyone knows crap, 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 crap is bad. Crap is bad. But our intellect says, well, I like it, so. You know, I really like that crap. I like that. Jack in the box, and I like those Taco Bell tacos. I like that frozen food at the grocery store. See those crazy people spending money on that organic? I save my money so I can buy more beer. I buy these conventional vegetables. <laughs> so these are the causes of cancer because our inflammation is largely managed through our gastrointestinal tract. The progression of nutrition is moving in that direction. So is there a researched link? It's coming, but there's no money on the other end of it, so it's coming slow. But our nutrition isn't just about fat or skinny. It's about turning on and managing our inflammation. Excellent question. So, um, why don't doctors, when patients are in the hospital, like when I was going through the cancer treatment, why don't they uh, make healthy choices on the menu um, for people that are going through treatment, and why do they 
describe it? Sure, and things with chemicals in it? Well, you know, come to my house on Friday night, I'll tell you the real answer is I believe it. But to answer it, uh, uh, I'm going to say on some level it's practical. Everyone in this room would not agree with the exact same meal. If I came up and I told you you're going to eat healthy, then you're going to argue with me. I don't want it. And if you're here for your appendix being taken out, you're only there for three days, I really don't care what you eat. Just get you done and get you out. So there are some practical measures, to be fair. And I saw that even with my dad in Texas. Because these were good people that took care of him. No one, no one is a bad person. The system itself is designed to be there when we all die. And continue on. So the system cares less about the individual. Yeah, it's just the nature of the system. When I was in pre-med at North Texas State University in 1986, in sophomore level human physiology, the, the teacher would be arrogant and start training us about how to be a doctor. Really? I'm just in physiology. Why are you saying that? There's an assumption that if you're in physiology, you're training to be a doctor. And there was one particular comment that was really remarkable. I was just absolutely crazed. And so we're in this gigantic auditorium with 178 kids, and you look and you see the professor way down there at the podium. He looks even smaller than he really is. And he just decided one day to kind of close the book, step on his proverbial soapbox, and say, building up hope in a patient having it come crashing down is the worst thing you can do as a scientist and a physician. There is nothing more deleterious than to build up a patient's hope. Well, I had to raise my hand because I didn't agree, and I'm like, excuse me, I thought killing them would be the worst thing you could do. <laughs> Immediately, he says, death is an acceptable outcome in science. You must get over that now. <clears throat> well, it, it is a jerk, but the system, death is an acceptable outcome. What is not an acceptable outcome are things that are individual, costly, or unique to each person. The system, not your doctor, the system. The insurance is built on the system. And it doesn't have your best care of mind. It never will, and it's not designed to. I even propose if we would go back to simply catastrophic medicine, a lot of healthcare dollar would, would decrease. But when we try to get our fingernails taken care of by our insurance, we try to get our little skin tag taken care of by our insurance, it drives up the costs. So from our perspective, we need to know that there is a system that doesn't care about you. Your doctor may or may not, but may have their hands tied. So we have to learn to work with the system. This is the reason I'm here. I'm not here to only talk about negative. I'm here to bring solutions. And Saturday, with Dr. McCannell and myself, that's predominantly what we'll be talking about, is how the system medicine and natural medicines can work side by side to help the patient and help the societies get better. Because what I believe the future is, is integrate. Take the wall down. Let us just look at the palette of tools that physicians have to help patients in crisis. That's the world I want to live in. Well, the way that's being created right now, you're living in the land of it right now. California is the most advanced in that by allowing what we allow in terms of our ability to have laws. Do you know that, as an example, the Chinese came here in the late 1800s or the mid-1800s for the gold rush, and they stayed, mostly in California. So, as they got more abundant, they had Chinese medicine. So they made laws in California in the early part of the 1900s that made Chinese medicine a real medicine. You had to go to real school, just like you do in China. You had to actually become a doctor, just like you did in China. You learned physiology, you had to learn all this stuff. Complete herbal protocols, a couple of years in your internship. Turns out, outside of China, we're the only place in the globe In England, as far as I know, you don't even have to have a certificate. You can just open up needles on the street and charge. They think so lowly of that as anything. And, of course, exalt the scientific medicine as the only thing. We're going to talk about acupuncture on Saturday, but before I conclude today, uh, if there's more questions, I'm glad to field a few more questions. Can you explain the relationship of cortisol with inflammation? The relationship of cortisol with inflammation. Cortisol is a significant hormone, group of hormones that are secreted by your adrenal glands in response to stress. Now we think of stress as psychological stress, but there's stress when you don't eat and your body just does it and it secretes cortisol. There's just stress when you're sitting in traffic and pissed off you're not home yet. There's cortisol flowing through your body. Because when you're unhappy, the millions of years of evolution says you must be facing a tiger who's about to eat you. There's, that's the only reason you'd be unhappy. 
So the, the body has evolved very slowly. Our psyche and our societies have evolved relatively rapid. So what stresses us, we don't even think it's stressful. If I'm stressed in traffic and then I got home, I might say I had a bad day in traffic and let it go. I don't really think I'm stressed. You talk to me tomorrow, I'm not going to tell you I had a stressful day. But my stomach had to sit for 12 hours in cortisol bath. Because once those hormones get going, they take six to eight hours to turn off. When you yell at your spouse for more than 68 seconds, I know that's never happened to anyone in this room, <laughs> but a few people yell a little bit more, then you got that negative hormonal threat going through you. And what cortisol does is increase inflammation. Why? Because you're about to be eaten. It's trying to save you from a bleed out. And really, you're just sitting on the traffic complaining about that in your beautiful Mercedes, you're struggling. I have to go slow. I'm stressed. <laughs> we have first world problems here. I had a lady in my clinic one time blow up beyond reason, almost like a nuclear bomb, that her massage was 15 minutes late. Storms out of the clinic, I will never be back, I'll tell everyone on social media. There was a lady sitting in the waiting room who heard all that, and when the lady leaves, the second lady said to my, my receptionist, well now there's a first world problem. You're late for your massage. Interesting perspective. Now what's funny though, or maybe not so funny, is her stomach still got a cortisol bath as if she ate the tiger, was attacked by the tiger, right? So who got the worst of her response? She became very inflamed and very acidic and probably had more pain. Cortisol and inflammation make pain. You can do cortisol blockers for a short period, but if you're still having crazy thoughts, it will never stop. And if you're still believing what you think, then, then you're done. And as my mother said, there are faster ways to kill yourself. You were taking the long, slow road to that. Because we all do die one day, so what's the point of all this? Well, if you understand the bigger picture as I have been presenting, and I'm not the only one who's presented this type of idea, is that there's something more to us than the physical. That's what gives way to the idea that there's more to us than the physical. So if the physical dies, then where the more to us go? Maybe I'm not dead. Maybe I transition. Maybe it's not what we think it is. Maybe when I live in fear and I'm only in the material reality, that that's all I can think of. And so therefore death is the scariest thing I've ever come up with. And I would say to you, welcome to your marketing brochure. <laughs> you have been sold a line. And when you are scared shitless, sorry that word's gone out twice on the internet. <clears throat> but when you have cancer, these words have to come out. When you are scared shitless, we have to stop this pretense of this lava. Oh, honey, go eat your salad, and that will cure you. Go eat your coconut oil, and that will cure you. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Did you try and see if your body liked it? Some people need more fat, some people need more carbs. What does your body say? Your body is the one who gets cancer if it does, and your body is what's going to heal you if possible. You have got to let your body contribute to your experience and not just tell it what to do. That is why my gift to you is my 15-minute relaxation. Because it's not just relaxing, it's actually relaxing from the cray-cray of your belief that your thoughts are important. And every one of you, secretly in your own head, think that what you think about is important. And if you tell me you're not, oh no, I know I'm not, then you're lying. Everyone believes their thoughts. And the problem is if we don't check into the thought, and we just run from that, now we're creating chaos in the world. The oldest thought written down in the Vedas, the most original thought that I'm aware of, and I study this stuff a lot, I could be wrong, but I'm not off by much. Oldest thing written in the Vedas from India said, man tends to believe his thoughts, and without checking into the validity of the thought, creates suffering for self and other. They didn't say the thought was wrong automatically, they just said without checking in. So if you come up and piss me off and I go, ah, I'm acting from within my reaction. That's the lowest level of human. That's the same level as the dog. That's the same level as the animals. This is not new. It is our ability to use our intellect to rise to our higher faculties that are already there within us. Sometimes religion gets in the way. It creates an intellectual slime that actually prevents the actual spiritual connection. My dog connects to spirit without any problem. You can see it when he's asleep. <laughs> he doesn't need to hear all this. He's got it there. And so what I want to give to you 
is my video. That's how I bring my heart to you, the hippie within me. The man that gets out of the suit and says, you know, this is for formality. We need to kind of break off this suit and get down to some real brass tacks here if we're scared out of our mind. If we're scared for our family. If we're not sure what to do. We need to address that even if there's pills. Pills cannot maintain. Pills keep you going until you can do the work. I like pills. I like this why I do medicine. But I will tell you, the first thing I tell my patient is I'm putting you on the supplement and we're going to see in about three months or six months if we need to take you off or we're at least going to reevaluate if you still need it. How many of you are on a vitamin that has someone telling you that? Let's check it in six months. Most people go, don't I just take the one a day for the rest of my life? You know, and, 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 and with kindness to that statement, the answer is no, I would check it. I would check it. So we have to check in with our doctors. We have to learn about this new functional medicine. But mostly, if I have any impact on you guys here today, how much time do I have? You're about out. I could be funny. He went over. I'm going over. <laughs> five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Sit on the edge of your chair and close your eyes. I went to college because people made me. I really like to not be. So sit in your chair, put your feet on the floor, close your eyes, roll your shoulders or your neck, release the tension that you need to be anything. You don't need to get everything I said. It's being recorded. Your subconscious heard what all was needed to hear for you today. So relax. Relax your tongue. Relax the eyes and the back of your lids. For a moment, just let your head fall forward, stretching the back of the neck, and see if you can let that section of the back of the skull have a little stretch. If you'll actively pull the chin into the collarbones, you'll stretch the top of the neck a bit more. Let the head gently move side to side a bit. Letting the head slowly come back up, ears over shoulders, keeping the eyes closed. Take a breath in. Hold it. Three, two, one. Open the mouth and exhale. You came already wired with something you may not know is in you. It's like an app you just discovered that you don't have to pay subscription to. It has never left you, but it takes requirement of, of, of practice. It takes You have to cultivate this. It doesn't come naturally in that sense. What's natural is to be scared. What's natural is to be resentful and angry. Jealous, vengeful. These are natural. We have those with sharks. We have those with snakes. We are humans, and we have an intellect that can rise us up into something more refined, something more abstract, something more non-physical, and they are within us. We are the crest of the wave of evolution. You are the ones who are changing the world by your statement of being here today, and those of you listening to us around the world. So as you breathe in, you are breathing in the same molecules that Cleopatra breathed. We are an eternal being. Breathe into the depth of your being. That you are not what you think about. You are not your mother's son or daughter. You are not the spouse or the parent or the child. You are not the landowner, the property owner, the renter. You are not the professional. You are not the male. You are not the female. You are not even the body. As you breathe into your astral self, your light self, even if it sounds funny, feel what happens when you touch this place inside. It is your continual development of this that will bring out your highest faculties. And as I anchor you in this moment, simply say to yourself, I am the one who experiences my life that goes on when the body dies. Let's take a deep breath. Hold the breath in. Three, two, one. Open the mouth. Exhale. Shake out the shoulders and neck. Open the eyes open. I'm Dr. Alan Arnett. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Please come and see me on my website. I have other goodies there. If you want to go into nutrition, I certainly can do a quick ad. If you want to go into nutrition, I can work through Skype. I can work on the internet. The only thing I can't do is actually give you physical treatment. But for those of you that are here in the greater Southland, I'm right down the street in Long Beach. Dr. Alan Arnett, Parkview Health and Wellness. Thank you very much.